All right, we're going to start a new series today, and it is in the book of Judges, a seldom taught book. Thank you, Lacey. A seldom taught book, but an ever-relevant one. It is the story of what happens when everyone does what is right in his own eyes. That's like the anthem of the book of Judges. That's the motto of the era, everyone doing what is right in his or her own eyes. It is relativism applied. It is relativism lived out. You can scan this, uh, this QR code, or you can go to uh, redemptionwashington.com and click on program to be able to uh, keep up with the, 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 the cross-references. So Deuteronomy chapter 30, here's where God set the stage for Israel, and they chose death. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. See, today I have set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. For I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands, statutes, and ordinances so that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God may bless you in the land you're entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not listen and you are led astray to bow down and worship to other gods and serve them, I tell you that today you will certainly perish and will not prolong your days in the land you are entering to possess across the Jordan. So there it was right there. That was the spoiler. In Deuteronomy 30, it was predicted, and this is exactly how it goes. In Joshua 24, 24, so the people said to Joshua, we will worship the Lord our God and obey him. Like, this, is, this is supposed to be how... The book of Joshua ends, but we know that uh, ultimately it would not go down that way. They would not be perfectly faithful to God. We had Moses as the founding leader of Israel, and then Joshua, his successor, and there's not really a successor after that. Rather, what we have is this era of the judges, okay? And you can see that uh, we, we're going to study Othniel, uh, Shamgar, Gideon, Tola, Jephthah, Elon, Samson, Ehud, his story is pretty funny. <laughs> Deborah and Barak, Abimelech, Jer. We know about Jer because we studied the book of Ruth and the whole event of, the, all the events of the book of Ruth took place under the judgeship of Jer. Ibsen, Abdon, and then you could sort of think of Samuel as possibly the final judge and the, the first prophet. He kind of stands in the gap between these two. So our, our devotions and our curriculum and our sermon plan will all combine to take us verse by verse through the book of Judges. I want to start us off in uh, chapter 3, and then our devotions will pick up in chapter 1. So here's Judges chapter 3. These are the nations the Lord left in order to test all those in Israel who had experienced none of the wars in Canaan. This was to teach the future generations of the Israelites how to fight in battle, especially those who had not fought before. These nations included the five rulers of the Philistines and all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites who lived in the Lebanese mountains from Mount uh, Baal Hermon as far as the entrance to Hamath. The Lord left them to test Israel to determine if they would keep the Lord's commands he had given their ancestors through Moses. But they settled among the Canaanites, the Hethites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The Israelites took their daughters as wives for themselves, gave their own daughters, uh, uh, gave, gave their own daughters to their sons, and worshipped their gods. The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They forgot the Lord their God and worshipped the Baals and Asherahs. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and He sold them to King Cushan. Rishathim of Aram Naharim, and the Israelites served him eight years. The Israelites cried out to the Lord, so the Lord raised up Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's youngest brother, as a deliverer to save the Israelites. All right, so we have our first judge stepping up. It's Othniel. And this is a time in which everyone did what was right in his own eyes. They had had the choice between life and death laid out before them, and they chose, frankly, death. They chose rebellion. They would worship Baal and Ashtoreth. Now, we've got to talk about what goes into this worship because like many pagan religions, it was really just lust. To worship Baal or Baal, 
was to commit sexual acts. It was seen as an offering of sorts. It was really just a packaging of one's own lustful behaviors as though it were righteous, as though it were worship. This is why Israel was so prone to falling back into this kind of idol worship. Uh, Asherah poles were massive phallic images. It was, I can imagine how awkward that was to have to tear those down. <laughs> like Baal worship, Ashtoreth worship, really meant just that the Israelites were forsaking God and they were transgressing sexually. Oftentimes, pagan worship is really just that. It's just a repackaging of one's lusts. So God often puts us at this crossroads, all right, the choice between him and something less, between obedience to God or certain death. All right, the, the depraved human nature with its strong proclivity unto sin, when untethered from God, always results in sexual abuse, violence, and the loss of human life. Relativism ultimately, predictably, and correctly results in rape and murder. It always has. It has over and over again for millennia, and we're living in a relativist mecca right now. When untethered from the commands of God, the sexual proclivities of human nature take over, and this is where sexual crimes come from. Thorns from the curse. We know that creation itself was subjected to futility, that the earth would bear forth thorns, and we know that all of the meaninglessness, all the subject, all, all of the, the futility of life is part of our careening down the slippery slope since the curse. And so this is, this is the way of things until redemption comes. We know that this book of Judges very much parallels our day today. We know that we're living in an encapsulation of the same kind of relativist mecca. We're not doing anything new in Seattle. We're not actually innovating anything. We are just reiterating the same futility of thought that reigned throughout the book of Judges. And so these, these nations left behind were there to... Where they, they were there to test Israel, and Israel did not pass the test. They were given the opportunity to, to repent. They were given the opportunity to, to, to serve the Lord, and instead they served false gods. Now, Othniel is the first guy up. All right, he's not a perfect judge. None of them are. Samson had a pretty good run. Gideon was pretty good. But every one of them ultimately is going to have a blemish on their record. If your hope is for this perfect human leader to step up, to be absolutely flawless, you're, you're never going to be satisfied. In the judges era, we had these imperfect people step up at a deeply imperfect time. And they would issue God's commands. God would bring about some modicum of repentance. But then ultimately, in the end, there would always be failure. Othniel is, is the first one up. Let's look, at, uh, let's look at verse 9 together. Can you guys see what I'm seeing? Yeah? All right. So the Lord's anger, sorry, verse 8, the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he sold them to this king. All right, verse 9, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, so the Lord raised up Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's youngest brother, as a deliverer to save the Israelites. The spirit of the Lord came on him, and he judged Israel. Othniel went out to battle, and the Lord handed over King Cushan Rishathim of Aram to him, so that Othniel overpowered him. Then the land had peace for 40 years, and Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. The Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He gave King Eglon of Moab power over Israel, because they had done what was evil in the Lord's sight. After Eglon convinced the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join forces with him, he attacked and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites served King Eglon of Moab 18 years. This is devastating because to worship as a Moabite worshiped meant to worship Chemosh and Molech, sacrificing one's children in fire. To have worshiped as the Canaanites worship was to forsake God. They had turned on the one true God and they'd become like the nations around them. 
Note the distinctiveness of the people of God. The necessary distinctiveness. And when we lose that, when we are no longer conspicuously righteous, we always emulate the sexual practices of the people around us in the era of judges and also in the modern American church today. May we never lose that distinctiveness. Be not self-conscious of your conspicuousness. As a man of God, as a woman of God, let your holiness bear witness. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and praise your Father who is in heaven. Otherwise, we're just like Israel in the era of the judges. If we just resemble the world around us, if we lose our conspicuousness, we are no longer salt, we are no longer light. Be not self-conscious of your conspicuousness as a man of God, as a woman of God. Be not self-conscious of it. So Othniel steps up, stands in the gap. The land had peace for 40 years. Okay, you're going to see in the book of Judges, that's not too bad, man. That's a pretty good run as far as judges are concerned. But, verse 12, the Israelites again did what was evil in the, in the Lord's sight. He gave King Eglon of Moab power over Israel because they had done what was evil in the Lord's sight. So we had 40 years with Othniel and then another 18 years where we're serving Eglon for some reason. Let's continue in the text, verse 15. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord and he raised up Ehud, son of Gera a left-handed Benjaminite. All right, interesting. All right, Benjamin means son of my right hand. This guy is left-handed as a deliverer for them. The Israelites sent him with the tribute for King Eglon of Moab. Ehud made himself a double-edged sword 18 inches long. He strapped it to his right thigh under his clothes, and he brought the tribute to King Eglon of Moab, who was an extremely fat man. Amen? Does that bless you today? All right, who, who, who here is going to say now that, that uh, this is your life verse? <laughs> I signed yearbooks <laughs> in high school with Judges 1-6 as my life verse. I just wanted to see who would look it up, and evidently one person finally did. <laughs> it's just like, why in the world did you sign this verse? It's a story of Ehud. All right, Ehud made himself a double-edged sword, 18 inches long. He strapped it to his right thigh under his clothes, and he brought, it, uh, he brought the tribute to King Eglon of Moab, who was an extremely fat man. When Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he dismissed the people who had carried it. At the carved images near Gilgal, he returned and said, King Eglon, I have a secret message for you. The king said, silence, and all his attendants left him. Then Ehud approached him while he was sitting alone in his upstairs room where it was cool. Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And the king stood up from his throne. Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into Eglon's belly. Even the handle went in after the blade, and Eglon's fat closed in over it, so that Ehud did not withdraw the sword from his belly, and the waste came out. Does that bless you today? Ehud escaped by way of the porch, closing and locking the doors of the upstairs room behind him. The servants waited until they became embarrassed and saw that he had still not opened the doors of the upstairs room. So they took the key and opened the doors, and there was their Lord lying dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while the servants waited. He passed the Jordan near the carved images and reached Sarai. After he arrived, he sounded the ram's horn throughout the hill country of Ephraim. The Israelites came down with him from the hill country, and he became their leader. He told them, follow me, because the Lord has handed over your enemies, the Moabites, to you. So they followed him, captured the fords of the Jordan, leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all stout, able-bodied men. Not one of them escaped. Moab became subject to Israel that day, and the land had peace for 80 years. After Ehud, Shamgar, son of Anath, became judge. He also delivered Israel, striking down 600 Philistines with a cattle prod. Man, that's bad to the bone right there. All right. So in Judges chapter 3, we see kind of our first judge step up to the plate. Othniel is the first. Ehud would follow 
and we'll see the stories of the judges unfold before us. We're also going to encounter a female judge, Deborah, in Judges chapter 4, and we'll speak about this. We'll unpack this text. We'll let the text speak and let it say exactly what it says, and I will submit to you that Deborah is actually a literally militant complementarian. You're going to see what unfolds in a society wherein people are just left to their own devices. Here's how the book actually starts. After the death of Joshua, okay, the Israelites inquired of the Lord who will be the first uh, to fight for us against the Canaanites. So at the end of Numbers, we have the death of Moses. And then uh, at the end of now the book of Joshua and the beginning of Judges, we have the death of Joshua. And there's no successor clearly laid out here. The Lord answered, Judah is to go, meaning the, the, the tribe of Judah. When you see the words uh, Judah and Simeon, for example, it's not just a dude named Judah. It's not a dude named Simeon. These are the tribes who have been allocated pieces of the promised land to go and conquer. The Lord answered, Judah is to go. I have handed the land over to him. Judah said to his brother Simeon, Come with me to my allotted territory and let's fight against the Canaanites. I will also go with you to your allotted territory. So Simeon went with him. When Judah attacked, the Lord handed the Canaanites and Perizzites over to them. They struck down 10,000 men in Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, fought against him, and struck down the Canaanites and the Perizzites. When Adonai Bezek fled, they, flew, uh, they pursued him, caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. That was my life verse. Right there. Judges 1, 6. I just wanted to see who would actually look up a Bible verse. Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes uh, uh, cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. God has repaid me for what I have done. So Adonai Bezek has to acknowledge, like, there's a little bit of justice in this. I did this to 70 other people myself. So they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. The men of Judah fought against Jerusalem, captured it, put it to the sword, and set the city on fire. Afterward, the men of Judah marched down to fight against the Canaanites who were living in the hill country, the Negev, and the Judean foothills. Judah also marched against the Canaanites who were living in Hebron. Hebron was formerly named Kiriath Arba. They struck down Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai. From there, they marched against the residents of Debir. Debir was formerly named Kiriath Sefer. Caleb said, whoever attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer, I will give my daughter Achash to him as a wife. So Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's youngest brother, captured it, and Caleb gave his daughter to Achash to him as his wife. This is a little bit weird because, uh, yeah, Othniel is his nephew. And so he's like, hey, whoever captures the city can marry my daughter. And then Othniel's like, sign me up. And then Caleb's like, okay. <laughs> he just goes with it. So it's a weird time. It's a weird time. She answered him, give me a blessing since you have given me the land and the Negev. Give me springs also. So Caleb gave her both the upper and lower springs. Now she is her father's daughter. If you remember Caleb, he was like the one guy who was willing to stand by Joshua and say, no, we can take these guys. We can take these giants. We can take this promised land. And now he's been given his own allotment and now his daughter has asked for both the land that she's actually been given, and the springs to go with it. She knows how to ask for what she needs. Verse 16, the descendants of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, had gone up with the men of Judah from the city of Palms to the wilderness of Judah, which was in the Negev of Arad. They went to live among the people. Judah went with his brother Simeon, struck the Canaanites who were living in Zepha, and completely destroyed the town. So they named it Hormah. Judah captured Gaza and its territory, Ashkelon and its territory, and Ekron and its territory. The Lord was with Judah and enabled them to take possession of the hill country, but they could not drive out the people who were living in the plain because those people had iron chariots. Those are kind of like the F-35 lightning of the day. All right, you guys see some fighter jets this weekend? Yep, those were like, iron chariots were like the fighter jets of that era. If you had iron chariots... Your, uh, basically all of your campaigns were, uh, were, were going to be successful. Judah gave Hebron to Caleb just as Moses had promised. Then Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak who lived there. At the same time, the Benjaminites did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. The Jebusites had lived among the Benjaminites in Jerusalem to this day. The house of Joseph 
also attacked Bethel, and the Lord was with them. They sent spies to Bethel. The town was formerly named Luz. The spies saw a man coming out of town and said to him, please show us how to get into that town, and we will show you kindness. When he showed them the way into town, they put the town, into the, uh, uh, they put the town to the sword, uh, but released the man and his entire family. Then the man went to the land of the Hittites, built a town, and named it Luz. That is its name still today. So this is sort of like a polar opposite of the, the encounter with Rahab. In the story of Rahab, she, was, uh, she served as a spy for the Israelites, and, and she, she informed them, but Rahab would actually become a part of Israel. This guy, meanwhile, went off and just started another town <laughs> by the exact same name that the pagan town used to be known as. So he's like a lesser Rahab. At that time, Manasseh failed to take possession of Beth Shean and Tanakh and their surrounding villages or the residents of Dor, Iblim, and Megiddo and their surrounding villages. The Canaanites were determined to stay in this land. When Israel became stronger, they made the Canaanites serve as forced labor but never drove them out completely. This is like, this is like the motif of the opening chapters of Judges. The people of God not quite doing what God asked them to. Not quite experiencing victory. Not quite doing what God said. Have you ever like sort of repented? You know, like you're almost victorious? That's the era of the judges. The people of God selling themselves short for all that God had for them. Refusing to completely cast out the enemy and compromising, just experiencing a fraction of the victory that God had called them to, and then what they didn't conquer would conquer them. Are you allowing the enemy to just dwell in your life? Are you allowing sin to just take residence in your heart? If so, you can relate to the book of Judges. You can look at the book of Judges and you can see your reflection. I'll bet your life looks a lot like this when you live in only partial repentance, partial victory, partial obedience to God's will for your life. If you want to know what it looks like to not quite repent, look at the book of Judges and what you don't kill ends up killing you. Walk in complete victory, total repentance absolute holiness. Just ask Israel what it was to live in partial repentance. Here's verse 28 of Judges 1. When Israel became stronger, they made the Canaanites serve as forced labor, but never drove them out completely. This was never prescribed by God. This was never God's idea. In fact, it was for such chattel slavery that God rebuked the Egyptians. That was the reason for the plagues, to demonstrate the impotence of the Egyptian pantheon. And now Israel has gone and done the exact same thing. They have become chattel slave owners themselves. The very thing for which they were delivered, they have now committed against the Canaanites. They were supposed to just live in victory, and instead they've emulated the same kind of evil practices. They become indistinguishable. When the people of God are indistinguishable from the people of the world, all the earth becomes darker. At that time, Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites who were living in Gezer. So the Canaanites had lived among them in Gezer. All right, so they, they don't drive them out, so they just live among them. They don't live in victory, so they just dwell in this awkwardness. Here's verse 30. Zebulun failed to drive out the residents of Kitron or the residents of uh, Nahalol. So the Canaanites lived among them and served as forced labor. There it is again. See, God never prescribed this. They're just, they're just compromising God's will for their lives. Asher failed out to drive the residents of Akko or Sidon or Ahab or Achzib, Helba, Afik or, Re, uh, or Rehab. The Asherites lived among the Canaanites who were living in the land because they failed to drive them out. There it is again. Watch this motif. Watch it come up over and over again because they just failed, they just failed to do what God called them to do. And so they're just living in this weird compromise. Naphtali did not drive out the residents of Beth Shemesh or the residents of Beth Anath. They lived among the Canaanites who were living in the land, but the residents of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath served as their forced labor. Again, this was never God's will. This was never God's idea. 
the Amorites forced the Danites into the hill country and did not allow them to go down into the valley. So the Danites actually are going to have a critical role to play as the story of Judges unfolds. And this aspect of the story is going to prove to be absolutely critical. But in this dark time, God is still speaking. There is still a glimmer of hope. Here's Judges chapter 2. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land that I had promised to your ancestors. I also said, I will never break my covenant with you. You are not to make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You were to tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What have you done? Therefore, I now say, I will not drive out these people before you. They will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a trap for you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these words to all the Israelites, the people wept loudly. So they named that place Bochim and offered sacrifices there to the Lord. This is interesting. Pagan worship is sort of like Schrodinger's cat. All right, raise your hand if you're familiar with Schrodinger's cat, the thought experiment. Okay, a few of you. Like the whole idea of offerings made to idols is like Schroeder, Schrodinger's cat to me. All right, Schrodinger's cat is this, uh, is this thought experiment that has to do with metaphysics. And the idea of Schrodinger's cat is that at a given point in time, the cat in the box is simultaneously alive and dead. And when I think about idol worship and I think about the false gods, they didn't really exist. They were just fronts for demonic forces. And so the, the sacrifices that are made to false gods are made to nothingness. They're made to absolute nothingness, but at the same time, they are also made to an evil force. And so uh, like Baal and Ashtoreth worship were, were like, uh, they were to ancient Israel what modern progressive sexual ethics are to Christians. The people of God are tempted by lust and want to be like everyone else. The ancient pagans and modern secularists alike may not even profess to believe in the sexualized gods to whom they bow, but they do the devil's bidding in the process. They bow down to the mask worn by satanic deception. Thus, the false gods simultaneously exist and don't exist, kind of like Schrodinger's cat. This is why Paul leaves the meat sacrifice to idols issue in tension, leaving it to the convictions of the believer while ordering Christians not to do something that would tempt non-believers back into idolatry. Just as pagan worshipers lured Israelites into lustful pagan acts, modern sexual secularists lure Christians into lustful acts. The former wore the mask of a pagan god. The latter wears the mask of progress, uh, progressivism. Both are actually satanic. This constant temptation unto idolatry was a trap from the enemy and it was really packaged in sexual liberalism. That's what, that's what Baal worship came down to. That's what Ashura worship uh, uh, came down to. Here's, here's a glimmer of hope. Here's Judges chapter 2 Verse four, when the angel of the Lord spoke in these words to all the Israelites, the people wept loudly. So they named that place Bochim and offered sacrifices there to the Lord. Previously, when Joshua had sent the people away, the Israelites had gone to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people worshiped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime and during the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua. They had seen all the Lord's great works he had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. Can you see how vital kids' ministry is? Man, it's always one generation away from extinction. It's so vital. It's so vital that we instill in our children a fear of the Lord, revering the gospel of Jesus Christ, because we're only ever always one generation of failed discipleship away from the whole thing being forgotten. This is the story of the book of Judges. That whole generation raised up and they just they forgot the truth. Here's verse 11. The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshiped the Baals and abandoned the Lord. And again, when you see this, 
remember what's really going on here. Okay, when you see that pagan worship, it's, it's really giving into progressive sexual ethics. The practice of Baal worship itself was sexually licentious. So they abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed other gods from the surrounding peoples and bowed down to them. They angered the Lord, for they abandoned him and worshiped Baal and the Ashtoreths. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he handed them over to marauders who raided them. He sold them to the enemies around them, and they could no longer resist their enemies. When, uh, whenever the Israelites went out, the Lord was against them and brought disaster on them, just as he had promised and sworn them, so they suffered greatly. The Lord raised up judges who saved them from the power of their marauders, but they did not listen to their judges. Instead, they prostituted themselves with other gods, bowing down to them. They quickly turned from the way of their ancestors who had walked in obedience to the Lord's commands. They did not do as their ancestors did. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for the Israelites, the Lord was with them and saved the people from the power of their enemies while the judge was still alive. The Lord was moved to pity whenever they groaned because of those who were oppressing and afflicting them. Whenever the judge died, the Israelites would act even more corruptly than their ancestors, following other gods to serve them and bow in worship to them. They did not turn from their evil practices or their obstinate ways. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he declared, because this nation has violated my covenant that I made with their ancestors uh, and disobeyed me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I did this to test Israel and to see whether or not they would keep the Lord's way by walking in it as their ancestors had. The Lord left these nations, and he did not drive them out immediately. He did not hand them over to Joshua. Such is the nature of our era today. We live in compromise, in less than what God's called us to. Would you consider the futility of the era of the judges looking ever on the horizon for a human leader who would raise up? I see it all the time in the political atmosphere. Some new candidate shows up and everybody's really excited. Hey, this person doesn't have any sin. Right? And we all get behind the new candidate, the new face, and then it turns out, oh, wait, actually they're just like we are. Okay, maybe next time, and then a new candidate shows up. Okay, this person is sinless and perfect. No, this, this futile hope, looking for a leader, putting your hope in some figure who's just like you, the futility has been told and retold over and over again since the era of the book of Judges. But one day, there did come one who is perfect, this is part of the reason for the virgin birth. Because Jesus was born of a virgin as prophesied by Isaiah, he is exempt from the sin nature. He is the son of God. And when we look to Jesus, those hopes are actually placed well. That hope that we've always had for a perfect leader, it's been found in Jesus. He's going to come and he's going to reign for a thousand years. But you know what's gonna be funny? He's going to have a lot of critics too. He'll be perfect for a thousand years and he'll have haters. Our hope in a system is misplaced. Our hope looking to the horizon for one of our fellow sinners to deliver us is misplaced. If your hope is that I could just find a boyfriend, find a girlfriend, I could just get in a relationship with somebody, they'll make me better. That hope is misplaced. Let that hope be in Christ and in Christ alone. The era of the book of Judges sought out a perfect one who would never come until Jesus. Jesus is now, currently, our judge. We sit under his jurisprudence and we stand before him, all of us, guilty of sin. In the era of Judges, we have a Rorschach test it shows us what the people of God do when all others cast off restraint. When we look at the book of Judges, 
we can't be too hard on Israel because we would do the same thing. But when we look at the book of Judges, we have what they craved. We have what they sought. We know him by name. His name is Jesus. And he presides today. He sits at the right hand of God the Father. If you've been kind of awash in cultural relativism, if you've been sort of just caught up in the culture of our day, wherein there doesn't seem to be anything that's really right or anything that's really wrong, and the church is sort of taking a back seat, not really speaking the truth, would you come to the Redemption Church? Would you come to the Word of God? Look at the book of Judges and see the fruits of such futility. You need a greater, truer judge. His name is Jesus. He's actually sinless. He's actually perfect. He's actually omnipotent. If you're tired of virtue signaling, I bet that gets exhausting. Man, if you're tired of keeping up with the trends of the day, oh man, what are we mad about today? What trend do I have to hashtag about now? All right, what do I have to pretend to be angry about now? If you're, that's that's got to be just absolutely exhausting. Would you come to Jesus? Would you come to Christ? Would you confess sin? Would you make him Lord of your life? There is a greater, truer, perfect judge, and he reigns in heaven. Your hopes are always going to be misplaced if they're in a human judge, a human leader. They're always going to let you down. Christ alone never fails. So would you pray with me? Would you pray with me? My skeptical friend, I know you must be exhausted. I know that you must be so tired of constantly looking for a new leader and looking for a new hope and having to defend somebody who fails over and over again. You've got to be exhausted. Would you come to Jesus right now? God loves the world in this way. He gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him would not die, but would have everlasting life. You and I, we've all sinned, and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to God the Father except through him. And so, drawn upon by the Holy Spirit of God, I want to invite you to confess Jesus is Lord. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what, Redemption Church? If you're tired of looking for a judge, would you come to Jesus who reigns in perfection? Would you confess your sin, confess that he is Lord? The futility of our day will exhaust you It'll leave you broken, and it offers nothing to atone. But the blood of Christ is perfect. The teachings of Jesus are true. My skeptical friend, I know you must be exhausted. Would you pray the words of God out to God with me right now? God, I believe that you love the world so that you gave your son so that I would not die but have everlasting life. I confess, God, that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I confess, oh God, that the wages of that sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I believe you, Jesus, when you said of yourself that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no way I can come to God the Father except through you, Jesus. So right here and now, fill with the Holy Spirit of God, sick and tired of looking for an earthly judge. I come to Jesus and I confess the truth. Jesus is Lord. Redemption Church, would you say Jesus is Lord? Say it. Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, God, let me be saved. Let me be saved. Let me be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. 
If you've given your heart and life to Jesus today, if you've prayed to receive him as your Lord, would you let us know on that connect card? You can fill one out on redemptionwashington.com or you can drop one in the box on the way back. The book of Judges is going to be an intensive study. Are you ready for it, Redemption Church? Let's stand up. Let's worship together as we close today.